Hi everybody, um, I'm going to do some online lectures for you um, to, to instead of face-to-face um, -face grinds. Um, I'm going to more or less concentrate on paper two because that's the feedback that you've given me. Um, the first section I'm going to cover because it's probably the biggest in paper two is all of statistics and probability. And then we'll move on to the different chapters then. Uh, the book I'm going to use is called Concise Project Maths. It's it's on the screen in front of you. So not the book that a lot of you is using. That doesn't matter. Uh, because this is recorded, you can pause the video on any of the pages. You can read them in detail and we'll work from examples from the book. And again, you can pause the video while you take down the important pieces of the questions. Um, I'm then going to... Um, also work out some of the the maths with you as an example and then give you some to do both from the book and then eventually from the exam papers when we have sections done. Okay so before I start I want to sum up um, I want to sum up all of statistics for you in what I call the data handling cycle. Okay, now how this works is that somebody somewhere poses a question. Okay, could be something as simple as what design of jersey do you think the club should go with next? You then collect data around that question that you've just posed, typically done using surveys of some sort or other. You then have to analyze that data okay, um, and in analyzing the data we could do it a couple of ways. Um, this is your means, your modes, your medians, it's your range, it's your standard deviation, it's your interquartile range. So this is real statistics down the bottom. Um, and then before or after we analyze the data, we could uh, present the data. So maybe I'll put one in here that will have us presenting the data. And we present the data in some sort of charts. So let that be pie charts, let that be stem and leaf diagrams, let that be histograms. It depends on the data that you've collected to exactly if and how you can present the data uh, before you analyze it. And then what the final step we tend to do is interpret the data. So again, if we go back to the, the Jersey example, in this case, you would be um, seeing, well, which Jersey came out on top, what colors, what stripes, so on and so forth. And then you might need to redo the survey again. So this is why this is called the data handling cycle. Um, you don't just normally collect data once and go round and round again. So I figure you're all um, fairly sick of hearing about COVID-19. This is exactly what's been done in every single country around the world every single day. This is how they have their data. They're posing a question, how many people are infected, how many people are dying. They're collecting that data. They're presenting that data to us. Um, they're analyzing the data to see, is it growing? Have we capacity in the hospitals? So on and so forth. This is all in analyzing and interpreting the data. And then they're trying to figure out, um, have we hit the peak yet or not? And then the following day comes again, they pose a question, they collect more data and so on and so forth. So in every part of life, you have the data handling cycle. Okay, let's go back to the book. Okay, so that data handling cycle that I presented back to it now again. 
is the entire section of statistics and in many cases probability. Okay, so the first bit we're going to do in this video is collecting data and data types and so on and so forth. We will then move on to uh, how to chart our data, how to do stem and leaves and histograms and so on and so forth. Um, which order you do these two in doesn't really matter. Um, we will then look at all the different statistical measures you can take on your data and then we may have to draw conclusions from our data. In many cases, as part of your course, that's a hypothesis test. Somebody will make a statement and we will check to see if it's true. So that's where we're going over the next um, few lectures as we see out the statistics course. So the first one is collecting and processing data. So data are pieces of information. Raw data is the data that was collected before any processing has, has been done. So if you check your exam papers, you'll see in many cases they will ask you to explain some of these words. The first one that's there is primary data versus secondary data. You need to know the difference between them. And you need to be able to give the advantages and disadvantages of each and I suppose some examples of each. So primary data is data that you have collected yourself. So this is you posing a question, this is you going out with your survey and collecting uh, first-hand data. Data that you collect yourself um, or someone you've given it to someone to do for you, but it's the first time this data has been collected. Secondary data on the other hand is what's called second-hand data and it's data we take off the likes of the web, we take it off newspapers, we take it from government departments such as the census or so on and so forth. So somebody else has collected this data uh, but we are now using it. Uh, primary data is obviously the very best data because it is new data, you have collected it, you are fully sure that it's correct. Secondary data is also very good, you just have to be careful that you're uh, taking it from a good source. So the advantages of primary data is you know how it was obtained, you also know its accuracy. The disadvantages though of primary data is that it takes up a lot of time and it can be expensive to collect it. Where secondary data then is easy and cheap to obtain because it's been collected already, uh, but its disadvantages, the data could be out of date. It could have mistakes and be biased. Biased means somebody presented this data from their point of view as opposed to just presenting the data as it stands. So they have a bias, so the data is biased. And secondary data, it may come from an unknown source of collection. Okay, the second thing you need to do then, let me make my page smaller again. Um, the second definitions you'll need to know is what's called univariate data and bivariate data. It's down the bottom there, page one. Univariate data is when just one piece of information is collected from each member. So in other words, it's one question, one answer. Okay, so maybe from a person you are collecting what height are they you could another type of univariate data is um, a separate question at uh, what blood group are they or it could be what eye color are they so each individual one of those questions are univariate data one piece of information bivariate then that word bi always means two um, is two pieces of information collected from each member of the sample so in other words Instead of asking somebody just their height, you ask them for their weight and their height. Um, another example of a bivariate data set would be where you ask them um, how many hours do they spend studying and what grades did they get in a test. Maybe you're trying to see is there a relationship between the two. Another one could be on a car or a tractor where you look at the engine size and the fuel consumption. And again, you could be looking for a relationship between the two. Okay, then types of data. What types of data could we have? So when you pose your question and you're collecting data, what are the types of data that you could be collecting? Well, there's two types of data, two main types. There's what's called quantitative data and qualitative data. Now, quantitative data, I remember as it's, it's a quantity, so it's numerical data that can be counted or measured. 
Now I, I just say I just want to draw your attention to Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. I'll leave it as that. Okay. So quantitative data can be counted or measured. Quantitative data is also called numerical data. So just check in your book, is it called quantitative data or numerical data? Okay, both names work and it just depends on, on the book that you're reading or the website that you're reading as to which one it will be called. It's all numbers. Okay, you can take this numerical data or quantitative data and split it into two types, discrete data, continuous data. So discrete data uh, goes up in, 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 in step sizes, so it can only take on particular values. So for example, shoe sizes is an easy example to give if you're asked to give an example of discrete data. So shoe sizes can only go up in set amounts. So you can be size five, five and a half, six, six and a half. So the step size between them is that set half a size. Okay, but you can't be size, a uh, shoe size 5.1, for example. That's not allowed. Okay, other examples of discrete data are the number of children in a family. Again, that set whole numbers. Um, it could be the number of goals scored in a match. That again is set numbers. All of that is discrete data. Continuous data then on the other hand can be any value within a range. So it's continuous. So height is, is, is a very common example used for continuous data where you can be uh, five foot one, you could be five foot two, five foot three, five foot four, five foot five. Um, you're not going up in in five foot, five and a half foot, six foot. So you can be any of those values in between. You can be five foot four and a half if you so wish. Okay, so continuous data. If you were measuring something in a lab, um, that can take on any value at all. If you were measuring the temperature outside, that can be any value at all. Now going back to COVID-19, um, the data they are typically recording is discrete data. It is the number of people that's been infected by the disease. So it's, it's a number, it's qual quantitative data or numerical data, and it's discrete data because it, is sets, it is set values. It is the number of people and you can't have half people. In a similar way, the number of deaths from COVID-19 is discrete numerical data as well. Okay, the next type of data I want to have a look at is qualitative data. Um, and this is data that's not measured, so I remember it as its words. Okay, so for example, if I asked you what color are your eyes, the answer to that particular question is words. It's blue, it's brown, it's green, so on and so forth. Okay, and just like when we looked at numerical data, there is also two types of categorical data. There is ordinal data and nominal data, which must be on the next page. So ordinal data has an order. So for example, uh, for example, if I asked you ordinal data has order, if I asked you what grade did you get in a test? Well then depending on your reply, whether it's A, B, C, D or E, they're just letters um, and they're just five letters of the alphabet. However, they have an order where one letter is better than the other when it's applied to a grade in a test. So for example, if you told me you got an A, I would know that you did, um, you were some of the best in the class. If you told me you got a C, I would know you were somewhere around the middle. If you told me you got an E, I would know that you're somewhere towards the weaker section of the class. So that is a type of ordinal categorical data. Another type of ordinal data would be um, the position you came in a race, first, second, third, fourth. Okay, another type of ordinal data, again, if I go back to COVID-19, 
um, a type of categorical ordinal data would be how sick somebody was after contracting the, the virus. So are they very, very sick that they have to go to intensive care? Are they sick that they have to go to hospital but not necessarily ICU? Uh, are they medium sick that they are going to isolation at home? Are they not very sick? Uh, they're one of the lucky ones that they um, have symptoms resembling a flu. So all of those are qualitative ordinal data. They have order. Nominal data then on the other hand, must be here somewhere, am I just missing it? Oh, they're called categorical. Okay, so uh, again, qualitative data has a few words as well. Uh, qualitative data is words, um, you can call it qualitative and ordinal is what they're using here. Um, your book will use um, nominal and ordinal. So nominal and categorical data are the same things. Um, nominal just means it has no particular order or categorical data. They are just data that can be described in words. So for example, if I asked you the color of your eyes, there is no one color of eye that is better than the other. It's blue, it's green, it's brown. There is no order to them. Uh, some other types of nominal data would be your favorite TV program. Again, no order of importance to them. If I asked you your, your county of residence, again, no, um, no order of importance to that. Going back to COVID-19, uh, qualitative um, nominal data or, or, or categorical data, whichever you prefer to call it. Um, an example of that that they are gathering is what county do you live in if you contract the, the virus? Okay, so in your exam, in your leave insert, how do they ask this stuff? Well, sometimes they will ask you to describe uh, quantitative data versus qualitative data and give an example of each. They might ask you for the difference between discrete and continuous data and give an example of each. They might ask you for the difference between, and they could call it categorical or nominal data and ask for examples and then ask for examples of ordinal data. Or they could give you examples like down here at the bottom in example 3.1 and ask you classify each of the following data as discrete continuous, categorical or ordinal in question in questions 1 to 24. So I want you to just pause the video now and try those six that's there. Okay, so let me take you through some of the, the answers. Um, so question one, the number of rooms in a school. So this is a number, so that makes it quantitative data. Okay, and it's quantitative, it's discrete data. It's discrete because you can't have half rooms and they are set values. Two, your gender, male or female. Well, that's words, so that makes it qualitative data. And one is more important than the other. So that is what's called categorical data or nominal data. Three, the height of a plant. That is quantitative data. And that is continuous because the height of the plant can be any value. Four, your position in a race, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. That is qualitative data and it's ordinal. So it does have a ranking or an order. Five, the number of texts received today. Well, that is a number, so it is quantitative data and it is a set value, so it's discrete data. Six, the mass of a bar of soap. Again, it's a value, it can be any value, so it's continuous data. Okay, and you can continue with seven to 24 there. And make sure you send me a message um, to check any of the ones that you're not sure of and I will come back to you. Okay, so that's your different types of data. So then let's go on to how we collect data. Well, there's two words there that's very important, um, which is population and sample. 
So when we talk about a population, we're talking about the entire um, set of data under consideration. So for example, if we were to truly figure out how many people in this country have COVID-19, the only way we can do that is to test every single person in the country at the same time, okay, or, or in the same day. So that would be where we do a test on the entire population. As you can imagine, that's not very achievable in a lot of cases. In a lot of cases, we are just looking at a sample. So a sample is a small part of the population selected. Ideally, your sample will be completely random. So for a population of Ireland, you'd put everyone's name into a hat, not into a hat really, but into a, a software database, and you would randomly select a sample from them. And they would be the people that you would do the test on. Okay, the big, big data collection that's done in this country on the entire population and the only one that is done is what's called the census and it's done every, I think it's every four years. And this is a big, huge survey. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's a big, huge survey where you answer questions on at everybody that's in your house on a particular night. Um, so that's what's called the census. Um, it's a collection of data relating to the population and a list of every item in the population is called a sampling frame. Okay, for all intents and purposes though, we are normally working with a sample and a sample is a subset of the population. When we take data from a sample and we analyze it, this is called statistics. That's what statistics is. You are taking data from a sample of a population. And when I say a population, I don't always mean it has to be people. Um, a population could be a set of animals. It could be a set of trees. It could be a set of anything that you want to examine. Um, in manufacturing, for example, we go to Coke. You could be looking at uh, a sample of two litre bottles of coke coming off a production line. Okay, the population in that case would be every single two litre bottle of coke made on in that day, whereas a sample is just a few of them. And maybe you're trying to see, well, how close to two litres are they filling? Okay, so population is more than just people. Population is the entire set that you are looking at. A sample then is a subset of that population. So statistics is the branch of maths where we gather data from a sample and we um, analyze it. Okay. When we then draw conclusions from that sample and we apply it to the whole population. So let me give you an example of this. If, if uh, we'd say Dancing on Ice was on television or Dancing with the Stars, um, and RTE tell us that uh, 2 million viewers were watching the final of Dancing with the Stars. Okay, how do they know that? Well, they most certainly do not check uh, what everybody is watching uh, during the final on that particular night. What they do is they take a sample of the data. They see what proportion of people were watching Dancing with the Stars and then they apply that to the entire population. Okay, when you draw conclusions from a sample, just like we did there with how many people were watching the final, and you apply it to the entire population, this is what we call statistical inference. And this is on your course, and this is hypothesis testing, if you have seen it in any of the exam papers. Okay, very important, whenever you're taking a sample of data, that the sample chosen is representative of the population and that avoids bias. So when I say it's representative of the population, I mean it wasn't taken from a specific subset. So for example, if uh, Patrick in the canteen was asking um, the students of Innescrone what their favorite dinner was, um, could he just ask 
the group of first years that were first into the canteen, first year boys into the canteen, could he just ask them what their favourite dinner was? No, he most certainly could not. So what he would have to do in that case is ensure that he gets um, some data from each of the, the six years and also male and female. And then he may want to include teachers in that or not, depending on the data he wants to gather. But he needs all years covered um, and no gender bias. So both male and female. So that's what you mean by making your sample representative of the entire population. And that is the only way you can avoid bias. The best way of doing it is a random sample. That is always the best way to choose your sample. So in that case, he would maybe go to the, the roll book and he would pick um, at random 20 people from it, 30 people from it. Okay, next page, page 81. So bias then, what is bias? Bias or unfairness is anything that distorts the data so that they will not give a representative sample. Bias can occur in sampling due to failing to identify the correct population. A sample size that is too small or using a sample that is not representative. Careless or dishonest answers to questions. Using questions that are misleading or ambiguous. Ambiguous means it could be interpreted in many ways. Failure to respond to a survey. Errors in recording the da data, for example, recording 23 is 32. Or the data can go out of date. So why do we use samples? So why don't we always use the population? Well, practical reasons. Um, so the reasons for using samples are they're quick and cheap. It's essential when the sampling units are destroyed and this is called destructive sampling. So in other words, we cannot test the lifetimes of every light bulb manufactured until they fail. That's called a destructive test. You can only do a sample of them because once that light bulb fails, it's binned. Three, the quality of the information gained is more manageable and better controlled, leading to better accuracy. Okay, and four, it is often very difficult to gather data on a whole population, and it's also very expensive. Okay, so again, you need to know the difference between a po population and a sample. I've seen them ask, what is a census? And I've seen them ask, what is bias? Okay, so then a survey. Okay, so this is the physical way we collect data. So you can see now, if I go back to the data handling cycle, let me just share this with you again. Okay, so the data handling cycle, we've looked at the different data types you can have. We've looked at how you are going to collect your survey. In other words, is it from a population or is it from a sample? And now we are going to look at, well, how do I design a survey? What is a survey and how do I design it so that I can actually collect this data? So you'll see as I go around the um, statistics chapters, I literally go around this data handling cycle. Okay. So a survey collects data information. I'm down the bottom here. A sample survey is a survey that collects data from a sample of the population, typically using a questionnaire. Questionnaires are well-designed forms that are used to conduct sample surveys. So how do we um, conduct surveys? Well, you could do a personal interview where you're literally the person that's, that's answering the survey is standing in front of you and you ask them directly. This is regularly used in market research. It could be a telephone survey, and that's one way of collecting data in a personal interview. So it could be in front of you, or it could be over the telephone. It could be a postal survey, a survey sent to someone's address. In the same way, it could also be an email survey. You could email it to somebody. It could be, and it's becoming much, much more common, an online questionnaire. So SurveyMonkey or Google Survey or one of those, they all have online questionnaires that you can design. So people fill out the questionnaire online. 
okay so what is the difference between them all the advantages and disadvantages of each so the personal interview high response rate you can ask a lot of questions and you can ask more personal questions um, I would also have another advantage in a personal interview in that people tend to be more honest when it's a personal interview rather than an online interview. A disadvantage is it can be expensive and the, in the interviewer can influence the response. So maybe by being there you're pressuring someone into answering the questions in a particular way. Telephone survey, a high response rate again and this is because you are doing it personally. It's very hard when someone stands in front of you and asks you to fill in a survey or calls you and asks you to fill in a survey. It's, it's much harder to say no than it is to ignore an email asking you to fill in an online survey. So telephone survey, you can ask many questions. And again, you can ask more personal questions. So these are they're quite alike. The telephone one can be more expensive. It can be expensive. That's because your time is very expensive. A person's time is the most exp expensive commodity. The interf interviewer can again influence the response. And it's a little bit easier to tell lies over the telephone than it is face to face. Postal survey is relatively cheap. You can ask many questions and you can ask more personal questions. In other words, it's much cheaper to post out 100 surveys than it is for you to drive around and conduct those 100 personal interviews. But with the postal survey, the, the response rate can be poor. Again, people can ignore it or bin the survey. It can be partly completed. Maybe you get sick of filling it in and you leave it there. It's limited in the type of data collected and there's no way of clarifying the question. So if somebody interprets the question wrong, you're not there in person. So there's no way for you to clarify what you meant by the question. Online questionnaires, cheap and fast to collect large volumes of data. You can just blast out that survey to as many people as you want and hope that they fill it in. It's much more flexible design. It's very easy to edit it and um, because it's online, it can be changed. It can be sent directly to a database such as Microsoft Excel. So many companies collect databases of people um, and you can just blast that off to everybody in the database. There's no interviewer bias because you're not there. It's anonymous because it's filled in online and there's no geographical problems. Again, you can blast it off to the whole world if you like. You're not limited by geography. However, the disadvantages is limited to those with access to an online computer. So perhaps, depending on what you're doing, this may lead to sample bias. Okay, so for example, if one of the questions was, do you like technology? Well, in that case, if the only people filling that in are people with uh, computers, then they are obviously OK with technology. So they are going to write down that they like technology. Whereas if you asked a whole plethora of people who didn't have computers, um, the answer would probably be no. So just by the very nature of the question and how you're asking or how you're, I suppose, doing your survey, you are introducing bias into your survey. Okay, the second bullet, technical problems. It could be your Wi-Fi, you could be limited by Wi-Fi, your computer could crash, it could freeze, so on and so forth. And then the last one is called GDPR, it's data protection. So protecting privacy is an ethical issue that is very important when you're doing anything online. So that's surveys. Okay, it's one of the most common ways of collecting data. It's not the only way. You can also uh, conduct an experiment. So it's a c an experiment is a controlled study in which the researcher understands cause and effect relationships. The study is controlled and it's very important. Uh, it, it's a very, it, I suppose it's, it's very important for certain types of data collection, such as testing a new drug. OK, so again, back to COVID-19, there will be numerous experiments carried out over the next few months on potential vaccines to um, protect people against COVID-19. Observational study is literally where you more or less stand in the background and you observe what is happening. So you're counting, maybe you're standing on a corner and you're counting the number of electric cars that are passing by. Maybe your survey is all about the uptake of electric cars in Ireland in the year 2020. 
Um, so in that case, you're just standing on a corner and you're counting and observing the number of cars. So if it was univariate data, maybe you're just asking how many cars. If it was bivariate data, maybe it's how many cars and the make of car. Okay, you could also do an observational study on um, on a classroom. So any inspector that comes into any of your classes, they are doing an observational study on your teacher and how they're teaching, how they're interacting with the class and so on and so forth. Okay, now data obtained by, ex uh, by an experiment is called designed experiments. So the data are collected by counting or measuring, e.g. throwing a dice so that's not really a controlled experiment, I if, if you get my drift, such as testing something in a lab, but it is a designed experiment. Okay, so maybe if I, a designed experiment could be if I flip a coin 20 times, how many times would I get heads? That's what's called a designed experiment. Um, so it's where you're doing the same thing um, a number of times over and over um, times um, and you have to be careful with the designed experiment that it can be carried out by anybody. And then you record the data from that designed experiment and that's often called data capture. And then you do some sort of statistics on it or you analyze the data or you do probability um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so as you can see this chapter is very, very wordy. Um, so just what I would suggest, I'm, I'm not even done yet, but um, what I would suggest is that you just make very short notes on all of the different definitions and you store them somewhere, um, maybe one A4 page, and you every now and again you just read them and these words then become real. Put in meaningful examples for you for all of the different data types and then you'll remember it much easier. Okay. So survey then, what makes a good survey a good survey? Well, always have a clear aim for your survey and ask questions in a logical order. So if you remember my data handling cycle, the first thing I had up the top was to pose a question. Okay, let me go back to that again. Okay, I have you pose a question. Okay, there's one very important question that you want answered. I didn't have pose a number of questions. Okay, um, and that's because if you pose too many questions, then you end up getting mixed to data and your one important question never really gets properly answered. So that's why at the top here it says always have a clear aim for your survey and then ask the relevant questions in a logical order. So one main question, so the one I posed for you is an example, so what jersey should we go with next for our club? And then obviously you have questions that feed into that main questions. So what colours should it be, uh, what design should it be, what company should you go with to design it and so on and so forth. So a questionnaire then is a set of questions used to obtain data from a population or a sample. Anyone who answers the questionnaire is called a respondent. So the questionnaire should be clear about who is to complete it. So who is your target audience for your questionnaire? Start with simple questions. Be clear how the answers are to be recorded. Be as brief as possible. Be able to be answered quickly be clear where the answers are to be recorded. The questions should be short and use simple language, provide tick boxes, be clear about what has been asked, allow a yes or no answer, a number or a response from a choice of answers. Not be leading in any way as this can influence the answer. So when I say leading, you could be in your, your a survey for your jersey you could write something by uh, you could write a question that said something like should oh, I can't even think of the companies should Nike be the company to manufacture the jersey 
So that is what's called a leading question. So in other words, I want Nike to design it, so therefore I'm asking you whether you think it should be them. If it's a non-leading question, it should be open bounded. What company should design our jersey? Okay, you don't lead them. So the, the questions should not cause embarrassment or offend. It should be relevant to the survey. It should be not be so open ended, which might produce long or rambling answers that are difficult to analyze. OK, a new one that came up with the survey I was doing this year, um, which is very relevant, is that um, um, on this example here on gender, um, any service we do now must be uh, male, female, um, or prefer not to answer and all of the different options that goes there. I, I can't even remember all of the different options. There was about three or four um, other options that was there beside gender, because that is now the world that we live in. Okay, so when you are filling out your, your designing your questionnaire, you have to be sure that you don't cause embarrassment or offend anybody. And especially in this case of gender, they may not um, identify as male or female. So, Yes, this section, this collecting and processing data is very wordy, but again, if you bring common sense to it, um, it, it's not overly difficult. So there's an example of some questions here and, and whether the question is good or bad. So your gender, male, female, this is a good, clear question. How old are you? Personal question, as people may be embarrassed to give their age. No indication of accuracy. So a better question would be which is your age group in years? Okay, only one response required, no gaps and no overlapping of boxes. So what do we mean by that? Well, if you're 18, it's quite clear you're going into 18 to 40. They didn't make this box 40 to 60 because then if you were 40, you could be in either category. So it's 18 to 40, 41 to 60. OK, you prefer to go out on Saturdays, don't you? That's a leading question. It forces an opinion on the person. So whoever wrote the survey feels that everybody should go out on a Saturday. And if you don't, then why don't you? A better question is on which day do you prefer to go out? And I would presume this question follows another one that asks if you want to go out and then says, if so, uh, on which day do you prefer to go out? The next question, how much TV do you watch on a school week night? So the comment on this is that the question is too vague because what one person means by a lot may not be what the next person interprets as a lot. A better question is how many hours of TV to the nearest hour do you watch on a school night? Zero, one, two, three, four or more. OK, and then there's some questions there if you wish to go through them um, and, and see what whether you think they're good or bad. OK, and that concludes that chapter. I would ask that you perhaps have a look at the questions, make sure you're OK with them. Um, but most importantly, do out a page of the important words in this chapter have a look at the exam papers um, if you want. If not, I'll be giving you the questions anyway in, 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 in a small while. Um, and make sure you're okay with the data. Okay, that's it for this video.